Uh, this is Dr. Julius Garden, and I'm very pleased to be speaking at the 19th World Congress of the International Academy of Cardiology. And the topic of my talk today is Stable Ischemic Heart Disease, an update on the guidelines. Now, I was privileged to be the vice chair of guidelines in 2012, which were sponsored by the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the Society of Thoracic Surgery, and four other organizations. And this uh, series of guidelines had about 150 pages. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about that, but also since then there have been other updates from the Europeans and other uh, sources that I think are very important to consider. Now in terms of the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease, treadmill stress testing remains the first line of uh, examination if a patient can exercise. If they can't, then a pharmacologic stress echocardiography or pharmacologic uh, nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging remain the next choice. Now, very interestingly, in these guidelines, uh, there are now class 2A indications for considering uh, stress uh, magnetic resonance imaging or uh, coronary CT angiography. In fact, the European uh, 2013 guidelines have said for patients who have low or intermediate uh, pre-test risk of coronary heart disease that coronary uh, CT angiography uh, should be considered also for detection of ischemia. Uh, and they've also said that in patients who have uh, severe symptoms uh, uh, that are suggestive of ischemic heart disease uh, and, uh, or a high risk pretest of having ischemic heart disease, that one can bypass these non-invasive stress tests or coronary CT angiography and go directly to an invasive strategy of coronary angiography. Now in terms of therapy, the guidelines emphasize that our first line of defense is what's called guideline-directed medical therapy. And that typically includes uh, aspirin, beta blocker, statins, also treatment, uh, appropriate treatment for diabetes and hypertension, smoking cessation, uh, weight reduction, and exercise and proper diet. Now other uh, got, um, discussions here are focusing very heavily on changes in the guidelines for both hypertension uh, in, in the new JCN, uh, NC8, for example, uh, uh, people 60 and over, we don't have to get their uh, blood pressure down to 140 over 90 anymore, but 150 over 90 uh, is uh, considered sufficient. And also major changes in terms of uh, treating uh, hypercholesterolemia such that we are no longer uh, treating to a number, but we are treating based on risk, based on uh, pooled cohort studies that define risk uh, in the population. And these have uh, uh, led to major changes and, of course, debates which are well covered at this Congress. Now, uh, if someone is having angina, they may need a multi-drug regimen to treat them. Beta blockers remain the first line of therapy, but patients may also need a calcium channel blocker or nitrates or renolazine or other therapies to help them. And even with the multi-drugs, they may still uh, have some angina and that may require other uh, strategies for management. It, uh, one strategy, of course, is to go to revascularization, uh, either percutaneous coronary intervention or coronary artery bypass surgery. But the COURAGE trial has taught us that for the vast majority of patients with uh, what's called stable ischemic heart disease, that one can defer the revascularization strategy until one first tries guideline-directed medical therapy. <coughs> uh, in addition, we've now learned from the FAME trial and other studies that before revascularizing uh, lesions when we're going to a revascularization strategy, we need to know their functional significance. We can do that with non-invasive stress testing, but what's become more popular now is using fractional uh, flow reserve me uh, measured in the cardiac cath uh, catheterization laboratory after administering a drug like uh, uh, adenosine. And the uh, FAME trial showed that um, a strategy of using functional uh, uh, fractional flow reserve measurement uh, in the context of also doing a percutaneous intervention uh, was more efficacious in terms of decreasing two-year 
uh, mortality and acute MI versus uh, just uh, doing the standard coronary angiogram in patients with multivessel coronary disease. In fact, it decreased the combined endpoint of mortality and uh, acute MI from 12.9% to 8.4%. So that uh, the concept is that we have to evaluate whether a lesion that we want to treat with uh, intervention is really the lesion causing, causing the problem. Another thing that has uh, been learned through the FREEDOM trial is that coronary artery bypass surgery may in fact be preferable to percutaneous coronary intervention in patients with diabetes and multivessel disease. Now the whole issue of following up patients with stable ischemic heart disease is also an important one and something that's gained a great traction is the idea that we no longer do routine testing, say stress tests uh, with uh, echo or a nuclear or standard stress tests or other um, monitoring uh, tools in patients routinely, say on an annual basis. We don't do that. We wait for a change in clinical status. And this is uh, the substance of uh, initiatives such as the Choose Wisely initiative in the United States and other initiatives. And finally, these guidelines uh, from uh, America and Europe uh, emphasize the uh, importance of the collaboration of the patient with the physician and the medical team in terms of decision making, uh, in terms of uh, how uh, one is treated medically or with intervention, and this is a very important concept. Well, it's a very exciting time in stable ischemic heart disease, and I want to emphasize that guidelines uh, almost are obsolete when they're issued because uh, there are so many changes that go on, uh, uh, but that's what makes it such a, an exciting field to uh, keep abreast of. One of the key things here is it's uh, the international flavor and also the multidisciplinary flavor. So for example, whereas I might go uh, into an area to, uh, to a conference that uh, concentrates on non-invasive imaging, which I'm involved in, but I won't get to see all of the other uh, fields like I do here, and, and often I won't get the breadth of international uh, experts that I see here. So I think this, uh, uh, not only in terms of the lectures, but in terms of networking, presents a very important opportunity for faculty and attendees.